terms of upskilling their skills and giving a different lifestyle. It's all in remote parts of Andhra Pradesh, etc. What I see today is the challenges to get people who are committed in the workforce. COVID has changed quite a bit in terms of people working from home, etc. But we would like to see that the youngsters come up and become more knowledgeable. We hired 70 over BTEC youngsters in the last six months for this new plant. They haven't seen a screwdriver. When I talk to them, I say, hey, listen, what is a positive part or negative part? They say, no, we were not taught about that in our school. So we need to start from bottom, sir. See, from the bottom, not only government, everybody says, yeah, government give me free money. No, we're not looking for that. We're looking for an overall development of skill set from the universities where we can teach them exactly what they need to do. So when they come to our plant, they understand. You see, again, perception, we import tomato sauce from Vietnam. Why? Because there are no factories here who are willing to manufacture to our specification. This goes in a shrimp ring. There's a ring cooked shrimp, and inside goes a sauce. We last year imported $7 million worth of tomato sauce from Vietnam. Now, we have tomatoes. We have plenty of tomatoes, and season time comes with 50 paisa and 75 paisa. The farmers complain, and, and uh, they create a hue and cry. There are opportunities here to set up so many ancillary export-related industries. And the cold chain is coming up. Karthik, he'll talk about the cold chain. Support is coming up. And I think this is the time when the youngsters who are here, I think most of you are youngsters, you need to understand the potential for the Indian products to be showcased in different parts of the world is immense. Don't look at the ethnic market alone. See, for example, there are Patel stores in the US, Sabzi Mandi in the US. We should not be looking at exporting Ladu and Jalebi. Ladu and Jalebi can be made at home. And most of our home uh, homemakers in the US, Indian homemakers, they don't work. So they're waiting for the husband, they make their own ladu, they make their own pickle, they make their own stuff. But we can do a lot more in other sectors. And in the mainline supermarket. So we today sell as an Indian company. I'm an Indian. I have an Indian passport. I spend more time in India than in the US. We sell about $200 million a year now of Indian, a company made of value-added products. Now, take seafood. Okay, we take chicken. Ten years ago, we never had KFC here. Now, what do we do with chicken? We make a chicken curry or we make some dish out of that. Now, we are seeing coated products. Chicken is coated and that is how KFC is. Same in shrimp. We have set up the first plant last year. We take shrimp and coat it exactly like KFC. It's called breaded shrimp. And it is a $1 billion market in the US. Only this item. So value addition and skill development and people is what this industry needs. I'll be more than happy, sir, to answer any further questions specifically. So, I, yeah. I, I think very interesting. You have a big story to tell. I don't want to tell the audience that you have written a book. I have written a book. It's available on Amazon. It's called By Choice. Not B-U-Y. Not by choice, I had to do all that I have done. It's on Amazon. Um, it could be useful for your life if you read it. So please, uh, uh, you can listen to the, uh, you can uh, read that. But I want to ask uh, one question to Mr. Jose: That how did you empower your workforce to deliver quality? You said you have 2,500 women who did not even have a pair of chappals when they came to your Vijaywada plant. Uh, how did you uh, motivate them? How did you train them? How did you uh, make them consistent in their performance? Let's talk about this near Vijaywada factory that we opened 15 days ago. It is a quarter of a million square feet plant. Reasonably automated, where we have to. But then we found the deficiency was manpower. Everybody said, don't start the plant there, you won't get women folks. We need women folks to work. So the first thing before putting the foundation, I worked with an NGO in Vijayawada, Dr. Kirti. She's a very popular woman. And we did a survey of eight villages around, 
50,000 population and women gender is about 51 to 52 percent. Then we found that their homes have domestic violence to unsettled homes, families, child marriage, childbirth, all these things we studied. And we worked with this NGO and we appointed animators in each village to go home to home. While the construction was going on, this is what we were doing. Creating awareness amongst people in those villages through animators. So we went to their homes, we spoke to them about personal hygiene, because we are the food business. And Indian perception, as you know, is not all that great. And this is handled by hand, it's a manual process. You cannot peel shrimp with machine. You cannot. You can only freeze it with the machine. You can cook it with the machine, but I always say the VIP in our industry is that woman, that lady who stands for eight hours a day on the, on the floor with controlled temperature environment. And we have a warm-up room for them to go up there and get a little warm. So we empowered these women, we hired them, and we started training them. We paid six months wages without work, only for training. Half a year they were paid, they come to the training room, as good as these rooms. And these women, they had no sandals to come in. And we had to teach them about daily taking shower. They had no soap in their towns. So we went and visited. They have no soaps. They use very conventional methods of keeping themselves clean. So we started to reach out to them and see that they got the essential tools what they needed for personal hygiene. Started training them. Today, let me tell you, when I go into the plant, and I'm going back to the evening, I came from there last night, they gave me high five. When I walk, they say, JT sir, they call me JT sir. They gave me high five. So we have brought the standards up, and they're more confident, and they're able to deliver a better job on the floor and produce the product that we need to produce and export and change the perception of our country. And this is what I've done on that angle. Thank you very much, Mr. Jose. It's, it's a... It's very heartening, it's heartwarming uh, to hear the story because, of course, we all kind of, we do business, but ultimately business with a human angle gives you the that talent management, how they are empowering talent management and workforce productivity in the organization as well as in the associates that they work with. Uh, good morning to everyone. Good morning to everyone. Yeah, good morning from my side. Uh, I'm coming from a company called uh, Bueller. Uh, like uh, Mr. Sulil said, uh, Bueller is an international company. We have an history of uh, 155 years in the world, presence in 140 countries. So we are truly a global organization. We are onto other side of the food processing, wherein we provide solutions to the grain and food industries. We don't per se make food as such, but we provide solution to the industries. So at uh, Bueller, I mean, for us, uh, the productivity, efficiency, and also the skill transformation, we always believe it starts with a culture. So we can provide n number of training programs. We can do n number of programs. But always, we have to build with a culture. Culture is one thing where we focus a lot in Bueller, coupled with, of course, the skill transformation. And also third one, the strategy. We don't prepare the people for today's requirement. We always prepare the people for the future requirements. So these three things for us is like a DNA of Bueller, wherein we have uh, multiple opportunities and arena. Since we are a global company, uh, we have talent development as well as skill development programs spread across the world under the ages of learning center. We have a Bueller learning center. Under the ages of Bueller learning center, we provide skills, talent development, uniformly across the world for the Bueller requirements, firstly, for us, the Bueller world. Second one, we also prepare the talent for our customers. Most of our customers also, I mean, like already discussed, most of the customers also want talented people to be operating their uh, mills. Today, a lot of people are available in India, but the talent scarcity is there in the market. People are available, but talent is not available. 
So that's the second aspect. First one, we develop talent for our own requirement. We develop talent for our customer requirement. Not only that, we also have a social responsibility. We also develop talent for the society as well as for industry. So these are the three pronged strategy what we have in Bueller. For each and every strategy for Bueller in, uh, requirements, we also have an academy set up wherein, like a university, we run five courses. Every year, we hire about 150 young students from across India into various courses. We train them, prepare, prepare them, make them industry ready. Wherever there is a requirement, we absorb them. Otherwise, we give it to our customers as well as to the industries. The courses in the university varies from one year to four years. It is almost like a four-year course. I'm, I'm very proud and want to talk about it a bit on the four-year course. In the four-year course, what we do, we pick up people from very rural villages. Like Mr. Joe said, I mean, we, here we concentrate across India. We go pick up people from north, east, west, south. We pick them up with plus two background. We bring them to Bueller, Bangalore. We have a curriculum wherein we prepare them for four years in Bueller. And also, we give them a formal education of vocational education. We, uh, we, in fact, we were the first one to come out with Bula, uh, Bachelor of Vocational Education System in post-harvest technology. So we have collaborated with a university in Bangalore called MS Ramaya University. So we have designed curriculum along with university. We prepare them four years. At the end of four years, he would have a formal education, BVOC, which is almost equivalent to BTEC. I'm very proud to say that and also four years of Bueller industry experience. That is where the real transformation happens. A village boy who doesn't even speak a little single word of English, who doesn't even know how to shake hand, he makes confidently the presentation to the board of directors by end of third year and fourth year. So that's, that's where, I mean, we are really feel very highly passionate. And many of these guys, they don't do work only for India, they do work for across the world. Again, talent exchange uh, is also another important parameter where we follow. So talent, whenever we are developing, we always develop them with a global mindset and also the global skill set, not only looking at, as I said, to the current requirement. So this is one of the transformative projects what we have. Then we also have multiple collaboration with universities. Uh, even with FIXI, we also have an uh, MOU, but it's had to be formally signed uh, by Mr. Sunil, sir. If he signs, then that also becomes uh, one of the MOU with us. We also have MOU with CFTRI. Uh, then we also have an educational institutions across the world. For example, in Africa, we have African Milling School. So we also send students to African Milling School. We have Swiss Milling School. We have Swiss Federal uh, Feed Milling School. So these are all associations what Bueller has because it has an history of 165 years. It has, it has really well established and uh, really well integrated into the society and to the requirements. So these uh, university courses are available for Bueller talent as well as for the open market also. So that's where we always believe empowering talent, not only by providing skills and education, also by providing the culture what is needed for the global outlook. So that's the main point I would like to bring in here. Maybe further questions again I can ask. Thank you Thank so you. much. I think there is a very another heartwarming uh, story and how an international organization is coming in to transform youth from rural areas. And I think there is hope for this country when large organizations invest funds. <laughs> so here you have a business. <laughs> Thanks. So I, I have only, I have, I have one question for you, Venkatesh, is that as an, as an international organization, how do you get the best practices from global associates and incorporate in whatever programs you're doing? I.e., are your, are your, uh, is your curriculum uh, similar to what is being done in Europe? Are you, uh, you know, imparting the same kind of global standards to students in India? Yes, sir. Uh, very good question. Uh, in fact, uh, Switzerland is known for one of the uh, top two, I can say, in the vocational education. US and Switzerland always stands on top of the world. So we have, in partnership with local government, Indian government, and also government of Karnataka, we are from Bangalore, and also with Swiss authorities, we were the first one, in fact, to introduce Swiss vocational education system in India. So the curriculum, whatever we teach in India, for one of the academy course, two-year course, is completely the uh, replica of what in, we teach in Switzerland. 
be it in Switzerland, for especially for Bueller, be it in India, or be it in America, we teach the similar curriculum. In fact, this is a PPP model, which we are very proud uh, about uh, this PPP model. And current, we are running this program for almost now 15 years. So the students who pass out from this Swiss vocational education system, again, it is a dual track system. I think people who know about Indian system, ITI, they also get certification from government of India. They also get certification from Swiss authorities. So a person after doing an ITI of two years, they do an apprenticeship with the Bueller for two years, they get two certification, ATS certification as well as Swiss authority certification. So they will be, uh, the skill levels are very, very, very high. So they are like hot cakes in the market if somebody does the Swiss vocational. They are also, I mean, my students who are passed out of here also getting jobs not only in India, they're also getting jobs in Middle East, Africa, even in Americas because of this Swiss certification. So we are very proud of uh, those achievements what we brought the Swiss education system into India, and thanks to government of India and government of Karnataka for partnering uh, in this journey. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Mr. Joes has a question for you. Uh, very excited to hear what you do. This is exactly what industry needs. Today, you know, even when I'm sitting in an airport, when I see somebody walking active, I go to them and say, do you need a job? Because we don't know where to go. The talent set, and unfortunately today when you hire youngsters and when you start training them and when you're a little bit firm, they, they quit. I've written on the subject, you know, throwing the towel before you review it. So it's great to know. So do you specialize in any particular field like mechanical engineering or IT services or production or post-harvest? Do you have any specific training program that is laid out in your curriculum? Exactly, sir. Uh, so as I said, uh, we conduct five courses. So basically, these courses are meant for mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and also the process technologies. Because, for example, if you just teach the flour milling, it doesn't. So we also, we also have an application training center, wherein we have a flour mill itself in Bueller, India. So we also teach them practically on the milling side of milling. When I say milling side, really onto the process side of the beet milling process side of rice milling, process side of feed milling, for example. So we also go into the in-depth Other than this. Other than the, the, the mill that you do, yes. do you specialize in any other industry also? Yeah, we are also, I mean, we are, uh, uh, for today, I mean, if you look at chocolates, I mean, uh, more than 60% of the chocolates in the world are produced. You answered my the question. Process. Can we visit your place? Sir, sir most welcome. You are most Let's welcome. Let's go, Anamika. Most welcome. Thank I you. didn't realize that you know people would strike business deals on this panel discussion, <laughs> but very good. I think it, it's very impressive. So uh, I think Bueller is doing a fantastic job, and right, uh, right, I think right, it's, right. it's it's a great right. work. And we are uh, we. Uh, I would now like to uh, talk about a uh, little bit about uh, the empowering, having an in inclusive culture in organizations because. Uh, you know, encouraging women participation in food processing because women tend to do much better than men, I, although I don't want to make that statement here very openly because best chefs in the world are men. So, you know, it can't be a generality. But the, in terms of food processing units, the preference is for women largely, as Mr. Jose has just also spoken about. So we have uh, someone who has worked extensively in gender inclusion and women empowerment from the World Food Program. So, Ms. Aradhna Shirivastava, she would, I would request you to make your opening remarks. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good morning everyone. I hope I'm audible. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, good morning everyone and it's a pleasure to be here with this panel of experts in their own respective fields. And I'm really getting to learn so much by the minute here. <laughs> um, so I represent the United Nations World Food Program. We typically work with some of the most vulnerable and marginalized communities. Globally, we provide food aid in humanitarian situations. But in India, given the fact that the government is uh, quite capable of taking care of humanitarian situations, our role has specialized into one of providing technical assistance to the government to strengthen their food and nutrition programs. One aspect that we are very critically looking at is the fact that there is a huge gender divide in India on 
probably everywhere in all sectors you would see it's visible and uh, also in the food processing sector. Now, more women than men you would find are naturally inclined to take up food processing. Um, however, what we find is women do not really get access to the kind of skilling opportunities like, for example, what Mr. Venkatesh was talking about. It is very difficult for a woman, more so from an impoverished background, to really take that step to be able to join an institution where she can learn some skills to be able to contribute productively to the food processing sector. Um, there are uh, you know, challenges right from uh, the family not giving permission, the institution being too far off, there is a safety issue for her to be able to uh, reach the institution. She may have had to drop out of school because of home responsibilities, so she may not qualify to join that institution. All of these hurdles really make it very difficult for women to enter into vocational education space in India. And uh, I was just looking at some statistics yesterday. Um, it's really, you know, the number of men, or rather the proportion of men in vocational institutions in India are double that of women. So it's like 36% uh, boys who are, you know, uh, currently studying are also doing vocational education, but the proportion for women is only 18%, and these are government statistics. So one can see where the starkness of the gender divide lies. How do you, uh, and as you know, Mr. Thomas has explained, there are certain uh, tasks for which you really want women, you, uh, women can really specialize and contribute productively. But how do you prepare them? And I'm really, really glad that Mr. Thomas took that much effort to be able to empower the amount of women he did uh, through his own industry. Um, what we find typically in rural areas, and now uh, currently, and I think uh, for the past 10 years, there is the self-help group program which has really uh, strengthened livelihoods at the grassroots level. And there are a lot of women who are getting into these small groups of 10, 15 women who are able to utilize the government program to get small loans to set up something. And they're starting businesses at the household level. It could be typically pickled and papered and all, but then they're and moving on to dry snacks. But then there is so much potential for them to really expand into something more organized with larger markets. Now, if we as a nation want to really be enter the global arena in food processing sector, we really need to take this half of our workforce along with us. And that is where we come in. Uh, so the UN World Food Program provides very basic skilling to women uh, from such backgrounds, which includes financial literacy, digital literacy, just you know, educating them on how do you set up an enterprise, what does it entail, how do you manage a business once you've set it up. How, there are so many different schemes that the government has, how do you access them? And providing them with all of these, uh, this knowledge and skills really builds in that whole process, builds a confidence within themselves that yes, we can do it. Um, so there is the government's vision of taking self-help groups from you know basic groups to MSMEs. But that route really needs a lot of more people like Mr. Thomas Jose or Mr. Venkatesh to join in and you know, really take that journey along. Uh, so um, that's where my niche lies and I'm really glad that you know, I'm in a forum where steps are already being taken towards that journey. So thank you so much. Well, let, let me tell you, uh, we have a long way to go. So, uh, but um, we have a lot of hopes because I was reading the other day that the number of candidates from the, uh, from the number of female, uh, females who are opting for STEM courses is more than men. So we have hope. It's not that we have lost the battle. I think uh, uh, women have, will definitely win. I think finally, as they always been at home. completely <laughs> by women. Excellent. ITCs, uh, I know very well. ITCs food plants in uh, Andhra. One food plant is 100% uh, run by women. 
and they actually ask us uh, you know can you get uh, iti trained operators who are women so there is a lot of hope i have i have one particular question you talked about sgs and you know there are few uh, women movements which are well known uh, i mean we know that kutumbushri uh, we know seva and we've also heard we also know lijjat is a women dominated lijjat papad is a women dominated uh, uh, organization you know how these companies how these organizations have been able to reach the global forum you know and these are all small enterprises network together network of networks uh, lijjat is a net, network of networks how they have been able to get into the global market what would you be able to share some insights into these organizations sure so i think that network is the key to the success of these organizations and they all started as you know women from the neighborhood coming together and wanting to do something to change their lives um i think power of the collective is what drives these organizations simple savings of 10 rupees a month and that's how seva started they were just asked to save 10 rupees a month uh put come together as a group contribute 10 rupees a month maybe what you collect towards the end of the month is 100 rupees okay can we give that 100 rupees to somebody to develop something um tiniest of in loans but internal lending and a certain discipline within the group inculcating that self discipline wanting to really reach uh you know the further stage and gradually that network increased and when that network increased those 10 rupees that they were collecting multiplied into crores and they were able to access institutionalized loans from the government from banks and along the way the government also helped them in various ways another thing that really maintained that they maintain now lijjat papad is like you know millions of women making papad in their homes but how do you get that same quality that was very important that was a focus that they realized as they were developing their brand they realized that they were really need to have that focus and so a lot of effort was taken to ensure that there is a standardization in the quality so the uh, mix of the papad that was being prepared is actually centralized it's uh, there's a certain proportion to it which is you maintain uniformly and so now you find that um, lijjat papad is a, a brand in itself a very well recognized brand you can find i mean i was visiting the uk and in uh, leicester i found with lijjat papad on the shelves in the market and so yes they have made it to the global market and another uh, usp of theirs is the social connect so i would buy a lijjat papad i would buy a seva product i would buy a kudumbishri product because i know if i do that i am helping women somewhere and that uh, you know that that the passion that they put in the show, uh, the social cause that is connected with their brand also helps enhance that brand value so all of these factors together have really helped craft the success stories of such organizations well very true but you know this is something which we all need to understand that internationally sustainability and ethical practices do get a preference so if you have an ethically produced product and you are actually having sustainable practices uh, you know people world over would look at you in a different way altogether uh, so you know this is also one way of uh, entering into people's hearts and into people's homes uh, next i would like to uh, request uh, mr jalan mr kartik jalan of indicool to share his experiences how he is able to support the uh, global excellence in this in this country and uh, what has his, has been his contribution to the food processing industry so that they are able to produce quality products not only for india also abroad um thanks mr sunil uh, for having me here and um, uh, it's a privilege to be in this august gathering i think uh, everybody is doing their part and uh i think i got an opportunity to contribute in my own way uh, uh we at indicold so i i represent a company called indicold i am the founder ceo there and we do cold storage warehousing and logistics and um in food specially i feel that in india uh getting from point a to point b has been 
a, a sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's just keep wahan pohan jai. You know, the goal has to just be to reach. How you are reaching, whether you are uh, reaching comfortably, is something that gradually now you have these Vande Bharats and all of that coming. And I'm talking about people, forget about food. Right? So people are coming into that forum where governments are uh, thinking about the quality of movement for people. Right? So now I feel the time has come and I've seen it post-COVID. There has, I, I always, in logistics, I say pre-COVID and post-COVID. <laughs> The world is different. It's it's a sea change in terms of what the what quality the consumer wants and what quality earlier they were accepting and they were okay with. And post COVID, what we have seen is that people want good quality products. People are talking about texture of product. That I, Mr. Jose was saying that in the U.S., you know, if my temperature is not correct, my product quality will not be good, and that's why he doesn't sell the products that he sells in the U.S. in India. And I was telling him that you know you should come in India now because we are getting there. We people in India in 2021 started thinking, when customers started coming to us, they started thinking and talking about quality of the product to us. And that was, we were very happy. You know, people who have been in the industry for a long time and uh, getting a customer who wants that service and is willing to pay for that, you are really happy to get a customer like that. So what we, uh, we got an opportunity last year to set up uh, a cold store, a BTS for a client. They wanted to store frozen french fries. And when we got that opportunity, they never talked about automation to us. They never said that you make India's first uh, frozen warehouse 30 meter height and all of that. We decided to do that because we wanted their quality of product to be the best. We, we, our customer never wanted that service from us. They never even paid us for doing that. We decided that, boss, we will do this because we understood the product. So when, as a philosophy at Indicold, we say that at Indicold, we care. So when we say we care, we care about the product, we care about the environment, we uh, care about the people, and we care about the, um, uh, the community as such, the community that we service and live in. So when we talk about these four things, on the product side, we knew that if this product is handled correctly, the fluffiness in that frozen french fries will remain. So on a shelf, my product, my customer will be able to sell better. The experience for the consumer will be better. So that was the decision which drove us towards automation. The second was, if I am scaling up in a, in a country, how do I scale up? I scale up by reducing the number of people or by making them more intelligent. So if, if I can get a loading and loading guy into my house, meet my son, and you know, play with him, or have that comfort that that guy is at that skill level that I can bring him home. That kind of drove us. So uh, we did an exercise which was quite innovative, and I think it's the first for the industry. Mohit is sitting at the back, so he came up with it. And at our plant in the warehouse, what we did was, all of our supervisors, we hired from a college. Instead of taking it off the market, you know, going and getting an unskilled labor. We actually got skilled labor. So we changed the way we looked at logistics. We uh, said, Ki, okay, fine, we'll go and hire. And it's, very, it's a idea which we see giving us a lot of returns. So that has now transformed into a faster path for creating leaders. Say, if I have to set up automated cold chain infrastructure in India, which nobody has till date done, I am looking for skill set which are not available in the market off the shelf. We have to create them. So we cannot off the shelf start from scratch and wait for four years to get out, uh, get an engineer out of that place. So how to accelerate that space? Plus, then we need, we are making 12 lakh pallets. So if I have to make 12 lakh pallets in India, I am looking at hiring 600 people. If I have to hire 600 people, we need to create those leaders who will be managing those people. So creating, uh, skilling is becoming a very important piece of our growth story. And for doing that, because we are doing something which is completely out there and nobody has done it, we even traveled the world. So we went to Philippines, we went to China, we went to Europe, went and saw all the automated cold chain infrastructure everywhere. 
and believe me i will spin a positive perspective to uh, the perception of india so when we were in philippines we were in a cold store which was 40000 pallets single cold store we entered and the guy said you're from india you are good in software can you can you manage our uh, plant for us you know and we were looking at him and saying we have come to see your plant and you're asking us to manage your plant so they are still wanting us to manage their plant so and it's it's a it's it's a positive perception also so definitely country has negative perceptions we we had a client we, we have a client for uh, who we are doing a build out right now so those guys uh, uh, they are belgium uh, people they they came to uh, up uttar pradesh and they have set up a plant so they told us that boss your plant uh, will take 2 years or 2 and a half years to get constructed we said sir it is going live in june july you come and visit they came and after they came and visit they uh, they kind of uh, said boss this is the best quality and all our team who was listening to them praise about our construct you know kind of changed the way we kind of perceived ourselves also because it's a validation right so we look for validation but what i what i'm saying is this this journey for last one and a half years two years has been that uh, we have to upskill through all of this automation technology which is coming in now it is not going to take away jobs what it is going to uh, instill need is people who can train themselves better who can upskill the existing staff to use those machines have like i was telling sir uh, we were talking just now on the table having a own little round table conference before every one of you came so i was telling him that uh, you know how do we multiply the efficiency of the staff that we have our goal at indico is how do we multiply the efficiency of the loader how do we multiply the efficiency of the guy who is doing the billing so can i use a robotic process automation to multiply his effort not to remove him as an entity from the uh, scenario but how to multiply and get more and more out of that from a throughput efficiency point of view and the way we are helping is by encouraging people to interact more go out see different uh, warehouses globally we have been visiting now we are having one in india so we are inviting people to come uh, in this uh, first frozen automated warehouse we have even made a uh, space where we are wanting to now establish a scaling center uh, where we want people to come and learn at the facility itself so it is uh, how will how else will they learn because there is no such facility out there so they will have to come learn there so uh, probably we'll sir take sir's help to kind of do that a uh, lot of things to talk about and i think uh, kartik uh, i think he's 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 probably the youngest on this panel and i, I think we are very happy to hear from him more in fact how have you uh, built a team uh, which has which is fostering innovation and quality and you are cracking uh, new uh, paradigms how are you doing it because uh, i mean refrigeration is taught only in uh, itis so how are you how are you creating the talent pool within the organization uh, what has been your secret um so i i think for this uh, there is no no secret per se i i think it's all uh, i will say time and hard work and experience and a lot of mistakes over the years so i i started off in 2013 in uh, with a, with our my own first cold store and uh, i we were thinking of hiring a consultant but we didn't hire one uh, i do not know whether, whether it was a good decision at that time or a bad but i ended up making a lot of mistakes so i i ended up learning out of that and in that whole cycle and journey of being an entrepreneur the most important job an entrepreneur has is people and culture everything is secondary and i think mr venkatesh said that you know culture is the top priority they follow and this year has is for us people and all about people and culture so when uh, my marketing team and other people reached out and said this is the panel that you you are being asked to speak on i said perfect this sits with my goal for the year so uh, the secret i would say is that i inherently trust the people that i onboard and i feel that to a large extent it has held me in good stead and believe me small things like this sometimes we don't talk about 
trust as a factor or uh, uh, you know telling your team that you know this is what you're expecting this is where you want to reach communicating that often enough so that they know what is the destination so that people are aligned and then they can come up with ideas and you give them room to make mistakes that has helped me finding the right skill set now like you said which is trained in india in cold chain is rare is rare and frankly we have had difficulties we are still hiring for this automated facility also for refrigeration and finding those right people is always a challenge but what we are now kind of getting into the groove of is that for all future builds we have to skill the talent within that building so that the next building which is now starting in november which is again an automated second bigger say 10000 plus automated facility the skilled talent is coming from our own internal skilling set center and that is right now something that we are taking up and doing and we are interacting with colleges we go to gati vishwavidyalay or niftam also or other colleges out there and try to get talent but refrigeration talent and you know this is not available so we there, have to there train is not college that teaches refrigeration uh, there is one odd yeah, college in punjab is. but very rare what gas do you use ammonia or freon so we do we book uh, uh, freon as well as ammonia yeah yeah and uh, screw compressors uh, we work with all kinds of compressors so in freon we have screw we, in ammonia we have reciprocating and so all kinds of compressors uh, so different thank yeah. you kartik so you know what it actually means here is that uh cold chain being very critical component of uh, uh, global business for go for uh, going global so we must have skills where people understand how cold chains have to be operated how cold chains have to be set up uh, for the students here who are sitting here i think you, we must all understand that multidisciplinary approach is what is required to get into cold chain and refrigeration so unless and until you have that you can't say that i am a food technologist so i will talk only of food so mechanical engineering is equally important for you understanding the dynamics of heat exchange etc you need to understand very well I'll civil work also you need to understand yeah I, i'll give you a simple example and i feel that that's why this knowledge is critical and especially for food guys all sitting all here so um, there is a, a good uh, government company very large uh, they have a cold storage they stored apples there so it's near delhi and they stored in the same chamber where they were storing apples they stored eggs now you cannot do oh, this you uh, what happened was the eggs went black now they were wondering why it happened now there is a court case going on where the egg guy is suing the government of india through that entity that you have to give me money back and they are trying to save themselves but han ji <laughs> i'm 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 not going to take the name sir so the the reason i am giving you an example is basically that knowledge of what food to store how to store having to understand each and every product is really important and the, i'm not talking about re even refrigeration here forget about refrigeration i'm just talking about basic knowledge of what food and how to handle it and everybody should know here because if you are in any industry whether manufacturing or otherwise if you do not know how to handle your product you will have issues you will have uh, quality problems and your product will not get there the way it's supposed to reach you know so that is just an add on on to what sir was saying is that this basic knowledge there is no course out there you will have to you know get out and skill yourself to do that we are now developing a handbook where you can you know read it and so you know each product how to handle it but yeah uh, just just a uh, you know sharing here uh learning never ends so but every time you can't go to college or school to start learning so you have to adapt to the new technologies which means e learning like fixi has an e learning portal where for food professionals and uh, students we have courses which they can do at their own pace and they also uh, you know video lectures which they can access so everybody has to uh, keep innovating keep learning keep keep educating you can't say that i have reached my destination because we don't know what is a destination because the world is changing when i started my career which was years ago i don't want to even shock you by telling you when i started uh, the world was different now the world has changed and world is changing in india every 5 years the world is changing within this country every 5 years so that's how the uh, the fast pace of changes 
Uh, now I would like to uh, invite uh, comments from Mr. Sabroto Ghosh. He is from the Quality Council of India. And I would like him to share his experiences regarding skill development and how they are bridging domestic talent, the gap in the domestic talent and matching it with the global opportunities. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, uh, Sunil ji, for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, good morning. Uh, I represent Quality Council of India. Uh, fortunately, I run a team of about 650 young professionals, right? And through them, we drive uh, key projects for almost 52 uh, ministries and government departments. Uh, so we understand what are the skill gaps and requirements across different programs and projects, whether it's in the food industry or culture or uh, uh, you know distribution. So uh, just to talk about QCI, uh, it is an autonomous uh, apex quality body with a single mandate to take quality to grassroots levels, i.e. take quality to the 140 crore Indian citizens. And that definitely has a strong element of skill development. So QCI has uh, runs two key initiatives. One is Gunwatta Gurukul, which is an initiative where we hire uh, graduates or people with one or two years of work ex from across India. Now, why did we focus on freshers? I think the ground was already laid by Mr. Joes when he said, you know, we hire freshers from top institutes but there's a huge mismatch and skill set mismatch in expectations also. You tighten the screw a bit and, and, and they quit because they don't know what to expect. So this is more like a quality finishing school of eight weeks where we hire these kids from across India. There's a very stringent uh, selection process including psychometry so that we are getting the right people on board because we will then invest eight weeks across which we also pay them monthly stipend uh, of 15,000 because the, a lot of kids come from uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds uh, and we also provide them meals, three meals a day and also laptops uh, because many of them do not have access to, to, to personal laptops, right? So the whole idea is not only to train, because see, bookish knowledge, like again, our, our uh, senior panelists said, they all know, uh, you know, what is an Excel, what is a PowerPoint, but how much do they know how to use it, operate it, right? Do they know how to make a presentation, how to interact with senior leadership and colleagues? So one of the key modules, and we have 32 modules across eight weeks, which has classroom as well as field exposure. So they also go on field. So for example, they are taught project management. Now, if you only teach them project management sitting in a classroom, they will never know how to get it implemented. So then they also accompany our on-ground project teams to see how things actually work on ground, right? To give them that practical exposure. We take them through a course called Campus to Corporate. What should they expect when they enter job? College life is over, right? You can't uh, enter an office with a torn jeans and a, and, and a t-shirt, right? Because ultimately you are, you are stepping up in your life. We also talk to them about Excel. We talk to them about government policies because a lot of policies need intervention. Unless they understand what drives them, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So net net, that is one initiative. The other initiative we drive is Sarpan Samvad, where we have connected almost 20,000 village sarpanches through an app. And now the idea is how do we leverage that platform to identify talent from villages? Because what is so far really an untapped market for India is the uh, rural uh, workforce, right? because they don't have access to the kind of things people have in, in big cities and, and urban areas. So we now want to uh, you know, go and, and see if we can start with a mobile Gunwatta Gurukul, right? Because we can't open in centers in every district and, and village. So we, we are having that concept uh, and debating how do we take it to villages. 
So these are a few, uh, you know, areas through which we are uh, looking at upskilling uh, not only young students, but also we are working very closely with Food Corporation of India. Now they have uh, almost 3,500 uh, uh, quality supervisors in all the procurement centers where they buy green or anaj. Now, when we talk quality, it, it has to start from the grassroot level, right? If the grain being procured is not of the right quality, the subsequent product from it will never meet the standards. So we are even going to those procurement centers and teaching them what is quality, how should they measure it when they are buying different kinds of, or different grades of grains, right? So these are some of the uh, you know initiatives we are trying to take uh, as, as an organization. I was just listening to this experts on various topics about women empowerment to skill development. I, for the last three months, I've been living in a village. I got a chance to wear this jacket, so I, was, I grabbed it. No shoes. I got lucky to wear a nice pair of shoes today. You all should try, if someone, youngsters here, wants to come and see what rural development is and to create skill development, come to my factory in Bapatla, Andhra Pradesh. It's about two hours from Vijayawada. To see these women folks, the struggle we have, we have built a five-star hotel there for the accommodation. Japanese Toto toilets, 126 of them. These women haven't seen a Western toilet. So the kind of training that we are imparting to them in asking them and inviting them to the real world is a challenge. And I'm telling you, I've forgotten to speak English also. Seriously, because I'm only Sarpanch, the town, and they used to commute 25 people in an auto rickshaw. So we brought up these pink color air-conditioned buses with woman empowerment written on it. And they haven't sat on a bus. I'm mean, that too with the individual seat. So transformation of our country, I, think I really admire what government is doing through you of reaching out to the rural India. And that's a Chinese model. See, if we can empower India on the rural area, I think India will be the superpower. We have the talents for it. We have the people for it. We have the resources for it. So I think all of you should understand there is something outside New Delhi and Gargaon. And I am in a place where you can't buy a Pepsi. But what happens is we employed 2,000 people in that area. They are spending money. So I noticed yesterday some of the women have started wearing stockings. Because they're a little cold. They have thrown away the chapels as standard understood footwear. They have understood stockings. That means somebody is buying stockings and the guy who is selling it is benefiting from it. So it's a chain, complete chain. When you go to the rural India, and I think you all should look at that as an apprentice. If anybody wants to come and work with them or him, I think you should take a lead on that. And I'm sure India has great possibilities and hopes with people like you all, all of you. Thank you. Mr. Jose, uh, I, I might as well share, since you talked of villages, Niftam has this program of villages. adoption of villages. Yeah. So, you know, this is very much in the mind. Um, I have uh, one question for Mr. Sabroto Ghosh. I think uh, the most difficult part is to create a culture uh, of, uh, you know, global excellence within organizations. So th the the society which comes to my mind is the Japanese, the Japanese companies, how they have been able to build a culture of, you know, not accepting anything. Chalta hai attitude, jogaad, does not work there at all. So what are the, how can we uh, inculcate this habit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, achieving, trying to achieve the best, being at the global standards. Uh, that culture creation is also part of transforming people, changing their minds. Absolutely. And, and uh, you know, it, it starts uh, early. And that's the reason we say, you know, there's a very popular saying, catch them young, right? Uh, QCI is also conducting uh, programs through uh, uh, one of our boards called NBQP wherein we are going to schools and trying to see how do we teach kids about quality, 
in a very, very simplistic way, right? Because unless, again, picking from your uh, concept of Japan, right? That's how they also do it. So I know it's a, it's a long journey, long journey, but somewhere you have to start. And I think uh, the most encouraging part is that today in India, across various industries, those initiatives are being taken with the right intent, right? And uh, given our, our nation's dream to become Viksit Bharat by, uh, you know, 47, I think we have also got a clearly carved out timeline. Because this concept that you have said, you can't do it without it, you can't achieve it in 2047. So I think people are now getting more aware, more educated. And one of the key things we also do is awareness, right? Because Unless somebody is aware of what should be the acceptable minimum norm, they will continue to accept things, right? So it starts from, uh, you know, within your house. So within uh, QCI itself, we are automating our systems. We are conducting trainings for our folks to ensure that they are also going out and driving quality. Uh, one of the key intent of Gunwatta Gurukul is to create quality ambassadors and not just employable folks. So when they take the final convocation pledge, you know, they become our quality ambassadors because they are coming from different corners of the country, from tier two, tier three cities. When they go out there, they are the ones as quality ambassadors who are going to spread that word. So I know it's a long way to go, but uh, I think it's a humble start which we have done. And I'm pretty confident uh, a lot of other people will join us in this march ahead. Thank you. Um, sir said something which I just uh, want to follow on. So I, uh, what sir, uh, Subroto sir just said was uh, that, you know, India is moving towards Viksit Bharat. And Chalta um, attitude will not work. So I, I, what I wanted to add to it was that uh, the biggest resource that India has is people. Uh, and the reason we will be number one, and we are already number one to a large extent, is because that we have awesome people. And uh, uh, so uh, we have this saying in our team that the moment you join Indicold, you are the best guy out there, right? Uh, whosoever you are before, you have transformed the day you are in the work profile because uh, you're awesome, that's why you're on the team, and we work with you to make you more awesome. Right. So I, I think essentially what everybody here is doing and what Sir is doing, that quality pledge and uh, what Sir is doing, even teaching basic things, uh, it kind of actually told me, gave me a lot of ideas on how we need to do at Indicold and what we need to think about from a scaling point of view. Uh, so thank you for that. Do you think private sector for training? No. Oh, yeah. You do. No, we see, we've just started, right? Okay. So as we build up, like I said, we are trying to reach out to uh, these uh, 20,000 uh, sarpanches, right? So, uh, you know, the journey has begun uh, uh, and, 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 and a lot of uh, learnings while we were doing pilots. We are trying to bring those learnings back into the main curriculum. So, yeah. So, uh, I think um, one aspect which we haven't touched uh, is actually automation and AI. Uh, you know, this is something which is a reality today and uh, we find that, you know, there, there is the big need for productivity, quality improvement and importantly is traceability. In food uh, industry, traceability is exceedingly important where uh, AI is being uh, deployed, big data is being employed, industry 4.0 techniques are being employed. So uh, how I am, I am raising this question for the panel in general. How do we take care of our workforce? Because some of our workforce is probably fifth class pass. And, uh, you know, uh, this is one question which I get, you know, the other day somebody was asking me. This is for regarding women, especially in the tribal areas. Uh, how do you train women in food processing if they don't have basic literacy? So th this is a challenge, but we are moving towards automation and AI. So what are the suggestions that the panel may have? How we can... Uh, improve the talent of uh, the workforce that we have as it is, you know. We can't say that four years later our talent would be better because we can't wait four years. Four years later something else would have happened. So uh, whoever wants to take that so in, they, in they, order, yeah. So I have a funny incident which is coming to my mind. So uh, recently, a couple of months back, there was this uh, one uh, warehouse manager whose emails started becoming so good 
like it, they were inspiring. <laughs> like inspiring, like crazy inspiring. And we were looking at the content of the email, the English and the way it was written. Yeah. So I'm coming to that. So it was written so well. And we were like, how does he, is he so good at English? What has he done? And later on, we realized he was using chat GPT. So, you know, exactly, exactly. So the, the, the thing that I wanted to share with you guys is that AI is invading our lives on a daily basis so much that uh, somehow it's so funny when we come to know about it but uh, you know it is happening it is happening and believe me i we got a tender document online we i i took a tender document online i just put it on the ai thing and just said ki isme, you know these 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 hit points tell me where it is and what page it read the document it told me all those points where it was so it is saving on time if i have to read say a planned document of a city i just upload it I uh, press search on tell me all cold chain related significant things. It will tell me, OK, these pages you have to read. So uh, it is changing. It is changing. It is definitely changing. How do we how do we get a workforce change? Because you are you are very intelligent, educated, but no, this is this is not was, something that I was I, doing. I would like to field it to Radha Ji. How what does what do you, what do you what are your suggestions? How do we get our workforce capability up in light of the fact that the world is changing very rapidly on AI and automation? And that is a that is a kind of a threat on our uh, doorstep. Uh. Uh, yeah, it is definitely kind of revolutionizing in a way. I would say because the changes are so rapid and so profound, uh, the way we are working. Uh, however, uh, the women that I work with definitely uh, we have to take the four-year route with them because they are not literate. Uh, right now, I'm teaching them what it means. How do you use a smartphone? How do you swipe? How do you access the internet? How do you send a message on WhatsApp? So that's where they are. That section will take time to reach here. But I think definitely the students or the ones who are now, you know, freshers who are, and even from, I would say, the smaller towns of India who may not have had as much exposure. But then, thanks to COVID, everybody knows how to use a smartphone, how to take courses on smartphone. So definitely, they are the ones who are really poised to take the best you know, advantage of the AI revolution. But yeah, it will take some time for the tribal women in the backward community to really reach there. Uh, uh, I would just like to substantiate uh, what, what ma'am said. Uh, one of the things we have seen is while, you know, people in tier two, tier three cities and villages, they are very keen to learn new technology and new ways of working. Often language is becoming a barrier. Because unfortunately, most of the training curriculum available is all in English. So one of the initiatives we are taking as we spread our wings is to go vernacular. So whatever training content we have, which is now tried and tested in English, we are now converting it into the regional language in whichever region we are going. So for example, you know, we have recently conducted trainings in Gujarat. All our training content was converted into Gujarati. We found a local trainer who first we did a TTT, train the trainer course with him for two weeks. Because he had to, he and she, there were two trainers, they had to conduct the whole training in Gujarati, right? And that kind of really, really improved the penetration and understanding of that training. All right? So that, I think, is something we have to keep clearly in mind, given the regional diversity in India, which is very much unlike you know, uh, US or, or UK. On a lighter note, Google Translate can be very dangerous. <laughs> if you're translating from English to Gujarati, you know, I can just tell you that. <laughs> No, we actually have, uh, uh, and, and you're right. So while we often use uh, technology as an enablement, we do have, uh, you know, language trainers who review the content because we cannot afford to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, translation errors when we are uh, taking the message uh, to a very, very large, uh, you know, audience, target audience. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah you go ahead. Yeah, as... Uh, Ar Madam Aradhana said, rural India is behind four years, and I think you should follow the four-year four route. Because uh, the level of comprehension is pretty low. 
communication skills are low and the motivation is also low. And uh, for example, we hired this 1,300 women and we requested all of them to open bank accounts. Because today with social audit that is happening by Walmarts of the world and all these, they don't want to say I paid the wages yeah. by cash. Yeah. They want to see to it that the wages that's reflected in their bank account. Yeah. So when we spoke to about bank account, none of them have Aadhaar card. We had a team working with them to teach them what is Aadhaar card. And then finally today successfully we've opened 1500 bank accounts in this village with a bank. And beyond that was, you know, we did a study on them. We imported these personal lockers for them. Okay, beautifully designed lockers with self-coding because they can keep the personal belongings in it. Now, when we did the survey, we thought they'll keep the cell phone in it because you can't take it to the plant. They keep the jewelry in it. No, we don't allow any any jewelry or watch or anything. Only two women had cell phone access, so they're far far behind. So I think we all have to get together and be committed in uplifting their lifestyle a bit so that they'll become ambitious. Once they become ambitious, even they can form a union, I said, if they want to make more money. Why not? Because that is a right as well. And this differentiation of executive toilet versus worker toilet, I changed it. I use the same toilet in the factory that my, we call them associates, we don't call them work workers anymore. And that has created that confidence in them. They see me go to the... So I said in an airport, Mugesh Ambani and the lowest guy uses the same toilet in case they have to use. So why differentiate that? That has created a lot of awareness among these women and the men to say that we are all the same. And that is where we need to start. I think that's a yeah. big beginning. I think we all should... Yes. So, uh, can you, can you address, yeah. uh, because we need to have some time for the audience as well because we have... A uh, very uh, young yeah, group. Uh, Sunil, you I just oh, want sorry, to bring in sorry, one sorry, point. Sorry, one point. I am sure that I mean we discussed about artificial intelligence a lot. It can uh, transform the future learning, no doubt about it. But uh, when it comes back to industry, I mean at Bueller also we have not exactly in terms of artificial intelligence. We have many simulations which we have worked out for our products and processes. Uh, any employee can sit at their home and they can go through the product process simulation, everything is fine, followed by question and answers, you can get a certification. Uh, we also have a lot of e-learning programs which are designed at a global uh, standards. We also tied up with a company in Hyderabad who can help us in preparing these programs. But ultimately, my experience, I mean, because majority of the people here, students from NIFTEM and others, I mean, all these things are good. But ultimately, when you come back to industry and when you go to actual work, Touch and feel is very important. Heart me kya kam kar sakta hai. That's what even earlier also our panel members discussed. But I feel that experience is experiential learning. I give more weightage than artificial uh, artificial intelligence learning. This is one point I would like to make because it's very important for young people who are yeah. sitting here. Yeah. Sir, Thank, you. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Sunil sir, yeah. I just wanted to add one thing, a different perspective to this whole discussion. Um, I feel, and it's out there, I know it's not right now. I feel that AI is going to accelerate into something uh, transformational very quickly, much more than what we have imagined till now. Um, whosoever who is working in this space and speaks online, if you have heard them speak in the conferences, the acceleration is going to happen in five years, not even, it's not a decade out there. In five years, lives are changing very, very quickly. I feel more than regular scaling, which anyways we are doing, I feel talking to people on empathy, on caring about the society. The training in this aspect, like we uh, said that you are opening the door, khulte moral science, jo hai, human values. I think training and scaling in human values and basic common sense is missing. I think that is much more important as we scale people uh, in our organizations because eventually when AI takes over, that is the only differentiating factor when you will hire someone. That is the that, only, that's a different, only different. That's a different perspective. 
you know, in uh, Fixi, we are uh, committed to introducing a program for food professionals in automation, AI, and Industry 4.0. And we're hoping by the end of this year, we'll be launching it in the major colleges of food processing because we don't want the the food uh, technologies to miss out on on this particular aspect, especially when they go into the industry. Uh, so I I would since we are coming close to the end of the session. Uh, I would like to give an opportunity to the audience here to raise uh, three questions. You can either raise a question in general or you can raise specifically to uh, name the panelist. So there's one hand which has come up. Uh, would you need a mic? Is, is there a, uh, somebody to volunteer the mic? Uh, hi, uh, good morning. Uh, lucky to have attended this wonderful panel discussion. I am myself, uh, Harshit from Coimbatore, Tamil Nadu. And uh, we have strong roots in uh, banana, nendran, and other vegetables from Tamil Nadu, which is grown, which is abundantly grown in Tamil Nadu. And uh, my question is in particular to Mr. Uh, JT, sir, as he said. Uh, sir, uh, being a Malayali, I know how much uh, Nendran bananas can be close to your heart because it's in part of every cuisine of uh, us. So, uh, speaking to that, uh, what is the future in frozen uh, department, say, as you are into ready to eat, and I was keenly listening to your discussion before the meeting also. Sir, so how can uh, vegetables grown from South India can be complementing towards this ready to eat uh, section or uh, to the frozen? Uh, category, sir. I'll give you the answer, you know, and, and I'll give you practical answers. We today use about 18,000 tons of frozen vegetables a year for our U.S. plant. Where does it come from? Venezuela, China, Belgium, and not even one kilogram comes from India. Now, why is this? You need to reach out to people. When I was 18 years old, I went to Japan and, and learned the language from there on, on. So question is, how commercial are you? How competitive are you? What technology are you using for blanching the vegetables? You cannot just export bitter gourd. If you take carrots, for example, we need carrot shoestrings, carrot dice. So you need just a vegetable cutting machine and a blanching machine and, of course, a freezer. If you go to the, any supermarket in the U.S., you have 15 to 20 percent of the frozen aisle selling frozen vegetables. And tropical vegetables too, which you grow in Tamil Nadu and all over the country. So potential for vegetables is so huge. We attempted it, but we couldn't get supplies. I went to Uti and Kodekanal to teach people how to go grow broccoli, Brussels sprouts bell peppers of different colors. But what happens is the supply chain doesn't meet our timely need. Hence, we went out of the world. So we have supplies in Belgium, in Venezuela, in Guatemala. So potential is great to answer your question. But do it right, and you've got to invest into some infrastructure. That's what we need. Anybody else has a question? Yeah. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Devesh Goyal, and I've recently graduated from NIFTM in 2024 batch in BTEC FTM. And currently, luckily, I'm working under Sir Leadership at Fixie as an executive new initiator. So in the panel, there was a lot of discussion about freshers, that there, the, there are some skill gaps that the freshers have, and there is a, also a chalta hai attitude, and if there is a lot of pressure of process, then they quit, basically, the job. So similar kind of thing that I also face, and many of my colleagues have entered the corporate right now. So we are like very much confused that okay, what kind of work we should be possessing on and what kind of different areas we should possess. Many of my colleagues who are in plants also, they are working right now, so they are struggling with the work-life balance right now. So like what, uh, and even there are some shocking cases by EY and McKinsey that have been coming up that in the name of an hustle culture, freshers are currently not uh, making up to that mark when they are joining a new company. So what, like Mr. Suproto also told that there is a, uh, the, about these things, so I would uh, know much better that how, as we youngsters, should be able to adopt it further. Who would like to take this question? In fact, I could have taken this question to you in the office, <laughs> but 
since you i think you have more confidence in the talent of the <laughs> panelists so you can you can ask uh, whoever i think so broto you like talk about it yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely happy yeah i think i think that's a very uh, grounded question you have right which 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 really really impacts a, a, a very very large number of uh, freshers uh, you know coming out of college and fortunately for india that number is very large right uh my only message to uh, freshers would be try to get out of the college mindset right because if you really want to make a career you got to be serious about it right uh even some of the best colleges they create very well learned students right who graduate but the basic mentality and attitude uh, you know towards work is for example you know i came across uh, you know some some uh, new hires who had very clearly in mind they are only going to work from let's say 9 to 5 life doesn't work like that absolutely you always have good days and you have bad days so if somebody is employing you they will not employ you by number of hours they will employ you with your quality output yeah. right so don't look at your watch look at what quality of output you are giving and also always be prepared to learn uh, you know i am coming from an iit iim great kudos to that but how much of actual ground work are you aware of there is so much for every individual to learn so i think initial 2 3 years people should have that open mindset that i am not going to job i am going to learn and once you have that attitude i think a lot of these niggles automatically get sorted that that's my two cents on it yes. so and, and eva is a very exceptional any uh, and uh, actually no i'll 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 like to change the perception on that a little bit uh, i am a little different in my thought process so i when i uh, did my engineering and i joined uh, sangar technology services as a software developer and um, uh, we, i was a build configuration manager we used to you know compile code and make that installer but which you double click and install so uh, the build out process generally used to take 15 days or 20 days to do it and as a young engineer i, I had a goal ki, you know i will do it in one day or two days and i'll give it to the team and you know so i slept in the office only two days you know and i did it i completed it in two days and for a year i used to do this my manager called me he made me sat down he said kartik what what the hell are you doing you go home you know it's okay it will take 15 days i said no sir i have written a code now i have to just press the code he said acha you don't stay in office now he said no i have to just come for an hour press the code and go home first time it took me two days but then it just used to take me one button to press it and go what i'm what i'm trying to say is you know uh, you when you start your career yaar you will have to work hard sometimes you know and uh, it's it's a good thing it's not a bad thing uh, i think the thing that we guys miss on is in nourishing ourselves properly uh, eating good food or exercising or uh, sleeping or taking less tension you know and those things are issues which kind of drive us towards uh, being unwell or doing something which is when you don't have that support system or you don't exercise enough i matlab mean, that's my learning of all of these things yeah i like to make a confession here I teach microbiologists microbiology. I've done my flying. I've done various things. I'm a level dropout. I have not seen four walls of a college. Forget IIT, IIM. You know what made that happen? Today I run a almost a half a billion dollar company without angel, without equity, without hedge funds, without partners, nothing. how did we achieve that simple hard work i lost my father when i was 17 years old 30 employee company 100000 dollars in total sales i am 10 of 11 member family i jumped in i was doing my pre degree in cochin in kerala i jumped in i came up and today this is what it is so degree or college alone doesn't make the difference it is your drive and the grit yes. you need that grit to youngsters i'm telling you to wake up early morning and do your bed first that makes you the total person 
that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, we are coming towards the end of this uh, program. And I would like to first thank the audience for being so patient. Uh, we didn't have dropouts. So I think we actually spoke some sense, uh, which kept you engrossed. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank all the panelists for sharing such important insights. And uh, you know, we have at least some understanding of how to empower talent and em to embrace global excellence. And uh, you know, these stories are the ones which will stay in our mind. Uh, there are many uh, blogs and many books which are available. You can do, read them, but none of these stories will, you'll find them online. So thank you once again and uh, wishing you all the best in, in all your pursuits. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, let's, uh, have a, let's have a photograph. Please. One minute, sir. I'm Sanjay Gupta from Ministry of Food Processing Industries yeah. and I thank all the distinguished guests for this. I, we have just a token of appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the recipients of BLI. Okay. <laughs>